aspects of western philosophy module 8 lecture 8 this lecture will be concentrating on uh, the theme modern philosophy or rather it aims at introducing some of the major concerns of modern philosophy its background the context in which modern philosophy became relevant in europe all these aspects will be very briefly covered uh, by this lecture so uh, when we talk about modern philosophy it refers to a unique period in the history of european thought and uh, this is very unique or this is very special because uh, we have already seen some of the very important contributions of uh, ancient greek thought and then from the ancient greek thought we have discussed uh, afterwards we have discussed the contributions of medieval philosophy or the middle ages philosophy in the middle ages where philosophy has become subservient to the uh, theological or religious concerns or it has become theology there is uh, no independent philosophical thinking available for almost 1000 years uh, which uh, this this period is designated as uh, the dark ages and when we come to modern period there is a kind of re-emergence of free philosophical rational thinking so this is what we designate as modern period in in european thinking and uh, one very important feature that is visible during this age is the diminishing authority of the church which we had seen was dominant during the middle ages the middle ages was completely dominated by the authority of the church the catholic church which controlled almost all institutions uh, that existed in european culture during that period so now we will see the diminishing authority of the church during this period and the increasing authority of science. So, this is quite interesting because on the one hand the, the church was uh, gradually losing its relevance, on the other hand science was emerging. The authority of science or the scientific temperament was quite visible in all aspects of life particularly in philosophy. Then on the political side again there is uh, quite significant changes uh, Europe has undergone during this period, states replacing church as authority that controls culture. So, nation states have become important rather than states uh, during this period. So, there is a change in the social, cultural, political and also economic domains that this period has undergone. And many important political events like the French and American revolutions have taken place during this period. They also have contributed significantly to the development of philosophical thinking, rational thinking, scientific thinking and also an entirely new temperament in intellectual endeavors during this period. And uh, uh, on the political side again democratization, the increasing democratization. Uh, constitutionalism, emergence of democracies, was concerns for human rights, freedom, uh, uh, individual uh, freedom, individual rights, all these ideas have become important during this era. But before we really start discussing philosophy in the modern age or philosophy in the modern times, let us have a very brief look into the passage from ancient to modern, from the Greek which we have already seen elaborately we have discussed the Greek philosophy, we have also seen uh, the contributions of the middle ages, but let us very briefly summarize this, these changes. So, this is the Macedonian conquest that ended the Greek city states, it is a very important phase in the history of Europe, a very important phase in the history of Greece and uh, what happened that uh, with the emergence or with the Macedonian conquest the concept of city states ended and uh, we all know we have already seen the contributions this idea of city states have given to the intellectual and cultural development of the Greek world. Because almost all major philosophers emerged in different city states where uh, Greek civilization was dominated by democratic temperament and uh, which promoted and encouraged free thinking, critical thinking, rational thinking, scientific temper thinking and all that. So, but the Macedonian conquest with uh, uh, Philip and Alexander ended the Greek city states 
the Macedonians were uh, later on conquered by the Romans. So, the Roman conquest of the Greek world again, the Macedonians were conquered by the Romans and the Romans were uh, later on conquered by the barbarians. So, these are the political social changes that Europe has undergone in the ancient time from its passage to, uh, from the ancient to the middle. So, the decline of the Roman empire by the barbarian invasions and by 5th century by the weakening of the Roman empire, Christianity had become the official religion of the empire and church has become the most powerful organization in Europe. We have already examined this, we have already discussed this in the previous lecture. So, I am not elaborating it here. And uh, when we talk about Christian domination, which again to summarize, Christianity as an institution based on unquestionable faith and rigid dogmas in the place of free, rational, independent philosophical thinking of the Greeks. So, this is what has happened with this domination of the church, the catholic church and the cultural milieu of uh, Europe during those uh, middle ages. So, uh, the rational free independent philosophical thinking was replaced by dogmas, rigid dogmas and uh, unquestionable faith. The church destroyed many writings and works of art of the ancient civilization charging them for being pagan, unchristian and immoral. This is what mostly religious authorities will do, have already done and even today they are doing it. Sometime back we had uh, seen what the theocratic state of the Afghanistan has done, it has destroyed the, the great civilizational heritage which the Indian subcontinent had, the Buddha statues saying that it was un-Islamic or non-religious. So, similarly the catholic church has destroyed many writings and works of art of ancient Greek and Roman civilization uh, charging them for being uh, un-Christian or non-Christian. And social, cultural, economic and political domains were dominated by the church and there was a kind of visible shift from rational to supernatural, from logical to revelational because uh, as we have already seen the Greek philosophical thinking or the Greek intellectual temperament was logical to the core, it was rational to the core, it was critical to the core. This was replaced by an idea of revelation because Christianity as a religion affirm that the highest form of knowledge is not possible to the employment of mere human intellect or human intellect is incapable of knowing the ultimate reality by employing its own powers. Real knowledge, genuine knowledge, highest form of knowledge is rather revealed according to the Christian tradition. It is never discovered or found out by the intellect with its own efforts, rather it was given to it as an act of mercy by God. So, logical was replaced by revelational, critical thinking is replaced by faith and acceptance which I have already mentioned, openness is replaced by domination and tyranny. During this period the middle ages we could see that uh, many attempts by scientists and free thinkers for critical thinking was curbed by the catholic church. They were killed people like Bruno, Galileo all these people were prosecuted and even tortured by the catholic church for uh, promoting independent scientific thinking which goes against the, its, its dogmas and uh, the, a faith based knowledge system. Science is replaced by superstition. When we talk about modern philosophy let us begin with a quote from Bertrand Russell. I, I quote the period of history which is commonly called modern has a mental outlook which differs from that of the medieval period in many ways. Of course, two are the most important, the diminishing authority of the church and the increasing authority of science. Bertrand Russell, A History of uh, Western Philosophy, unquote. So, this is what Bert Russell has to say, we have already mentioned this, that uh, it is a mental outlook which differs from the medieval period. So, there is something which is new that is coming up and to understand what you mean by modern or modern temperament, modern philosophy, modern outlook, we have to understand certain very important cultural and historical events that took place during this time. The most important one is what we today designate as 
the renaissance. Of course, there is the scientific revolution, there is the reformation, religious reformation movements initiated by the protestant church or rather the, the people like Martin Luther and many other factors, but all these factors can be summarized under one heading that is renaissance. The term renaissance, it is a French word for rebirth. So, you can see that what does it mean? It means a rebirth, what is reborn? Rebirth of reason, the reason or rational thinking, critical thinking which was there in European history, which was there during the Greek period was curbed or was controlled, was dominated by the dogmas of church, which is now taking a revival during this period. That period is called renaissance and change is witnessed in almost all realms of human life, all realms of cultural life, art, philosophy, literature, uh, anything for that matter. There is no end for human curiosity to know and to understand nature. The way in which man understands nature, relate himself with nature, everything changes during this period. Because according to the dominant Christian thinking, the world was created by God. So, it was given to man by God, uh, it expresses the supernatural, it is a mere expression of the supernatural or to put it in a different way, trying to see it from a platonic perspective, it is a copy of the real. There is some real world somewhere else, which is God's domain, the heaven and this world is something which needs to be, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are here, we find ourselves here, we are helpless, we have to overcome that and regain the paradise which is lost. So, this uh, conception of world is replaced by a very positive approach towards nature. Nature is being viewed by man with a new spirit. It is not something which is a mere expression of the supernatural, but nature as such is valuable. Man has to find himself in nature, see nature, understand it. There are ways to understand it, there are ways to cope up with nature, there are different ways to cope up with nature, not just living in it, but changing in it, changing nature. The way in which the world functions can be changed. So, science aims at that, all these are part of uh, this uh, renaissance temperament. The modern outlook began in Italy with renaissance and uh, the revival of uh, the ancient wisdom. So, to put it in one sentence, renaissance is nothing but the revival of the ancient wisdom, the revival of the outlook of the ancient Greek and Roman civilization, which is significantly different from the middle ages outlook, which is dominated by Christian church. The recognition that the ancient wisdom is the source of valuable insight. So, this is another very important aspect to be noted, to be underlined that this period, there is a general recognition in the society that the ancient world is a valuable source of uh, wisdom and insight. Uh, and it is spanning the period from the middle of the 14th century to the beginning of the 17th century. So, this is what we normally designate as renaissance uh, so from the middle of the 14th century to the beginning of the 17th century. And by 15th century, the original Greek works were read and appreciated. So, this is very important uh, because with the domination of church, uh, the churches uh, or the Catholic church had it with its own vested interest as uh, interpreted almost all Greek text in its own uh, terms in uh, from the light of its own world views. So, it was not possible for uh, to read these original Greek uh, text without uh, interpretations uh, given by the Catholic church. The Catholic church gave certain original interpretation for all these things. Now, but by 15th century what happened was there is a possibility, a possibility was opening up for reading, for revisiting these texts in their original form. Saint Thomas interpretation of Aristotle's were critically appreciated. This is another thing, because I have already mentioned in the previous lecture that the contributions of Saint Thomas Aquinas. Saint Thomas Aquinas was uh, an Aristotelian who has uh, interpreted many of Aristotle's very important texts like the Nicomachean ethics, the metaphysics and all that. But the, these interpretations provided by Saint Thomas were uh, 
considered as authoritative by the Catholic Church, but now these interpretations were viewed skeptically. People started reading them, encountering them directly and uh, started uh, skeptically viewing the interpretations provided by the Catholic Church, predominantly the Thomistic interpretations were viewed with uh, reasonable skepticism. The recovery of uh, the classical languages, literature, art, history and philosophical insights resulted in the revival of the spirit of Greek humanism. This is another point which we need to be acknowledged that there is an emergence of a kind of humanism which was not present during the middle ages. The kind of humanism which was there during the Greek period, where the power of human faculty, the power of human intellect is recognized and acknowledged in the pursuit of real genuine knowledge. Now, when we talk about humanism recognition of the dignity and worth of human beings, this is what we mean by humanism. This was there in the Greek period as I just mentioned and this is recognized by the modern philosophers as well, acknowledge the power of human reason to know the truths of nature. It is not just revealed to us, all knowledge is not merely revelational, but rather human beings can employ their natural power, natural faculties of intellect to understand nature and to interpret it and to change it, to predict what is going to happen. All these things were made possible with the uh, recognition of uh, the dignity and worth of human beings. To realize that we humans have the capacity to determine, express and achieve what is good for us. So, this is another very important thing, see the last word uh, what is good for us. There are very strong ethical implications. As per the official Catholic doctrine, what is good for human beings are already written down in the Bible already revealed to man by God directly. So, man is not supposed to employ his intellect independent of what is given, what is written down, what is already proclaimed, but he has to just follow. Here what is good life is decided by the text which is already written. Goodness is something which is already written down, which is already decided, pre-decided. Human nature is pre-decided, man is not free. But here with the humanism, with the renaissance to realize that we humans have the capacity to determine, express and achieve what is good for us. So, human reason can be independently employed in order to understand what is good, in order to understand what is desirable, in order to understand everything that concerns about our day to day life in this world. So, this is a very important revelation that had happened in during the renaissance period. Again I have just mentioned about the ethical implications, when I talk about the idea of the good, the Greeks always had a very peculiar conception of the good, which is linked with the participation in the life of the city states, where the social and the political aspects are emphasized. The social political aspects, participation in the Greek city states with fellow citizen. So, you listen to each other, there is a kind of approach, there is a kind of tolerance, there is a kind of openness to what others have to say, the views and opinions of others is very important. So, each one of us as an individual has to live with others and uh, by listening to others, by negotiating with others our conceptions about life. It is not that you know there is something a set of principles, a set of doctrines are already pre-given to all of us, but we determine it. So, this is the approach which which was already present during the Greek period, which now takes a revival during the modern period. In middle ages to live according to the dictums of the church, so it was already written down and renaissance a revival of the ancient humanistic and the socio-political approaches and outlook is visible. Now, when we talk about the renaissance consciousness, renaissance is to restore to man the capacities strengths and power of the individual person which the middle ages had ignored. So, it is to restore to man that his capacities and strengths which is which is actually he has, he possesses and uh, this is to recognize the dignity of man and emphasis on individual achievements. So, it is not that everything humankind has achieved reflects the 
eternal kindness and mercy of the divine. No, human beings have certain abilities, certain capabilities to attain things. So, emphasis on individual achievements, superiority of the culture of the ancient world and not the present world. So, there is a recognition that the ancient world was superior, the Greek world was superior. Looking ahead to a new model of life, now you have to reshape your life, remodel your life based on insights, valuable insights that are available in the ancient traditions, revisit them, directly encounter them and uh, try to imbibe them to the new modern situations. Now, another very important element that characterized the emergence of uh, renaissance uh, uh, outlook and modern philosophical perspectives is the rise of science. Very important this is, because modern science emerges during this period. And uh, we can see that many important scientists like Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo and Newton are uh, the preeminent scientists during this age. Though there are many others, these four are the most important ones. And uh, uh, we could see that uh, Copernicus's uh, heliocentric view of the universe has overthrown existing paradigms. Catholic church has uh, 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 subscribed to a conception of universe, how the universe was uh, created, the God created the world and uh, uh, all these uh, conceptions, all these pre-modern conceptions were overthrown by Copernicus heliocentric view, which very boldly proclaimed that the sun is at the center. And Kepler came up with mathematical interpretations of the heliocentric view. So, now you have presented a theory based on certain observations you made, certain systematic observations you made and this observations were uh, further uh, reinstated and uh, justified in the light of uh, uh, mathematical interpretations, which is uh, provided by Kepler and Galileo developed the observation method with mathematical interpretations to new insight. There is a celebrated statement made by Galileo. Galileo's period is very important in the whole history of human intellect, the whole history of western philosophy or western history. This is very important period, because it was Galileo who brought together in a very systematic way, in a very emphatic manner, the two elements of scientific temperament. On the one hand, the empirical observation and on the other hand, mathematical interpretations. So, Galileo's famous statement that nature is an open book written in the language of mathematics testifies this. Nature, I repeat, nature is an open book written in the language of mathematics. So, if you know the language, you can read it. To know the language, you have to learn mathematics. To read it, you have to observe. Now, observation needs to be synchronized with mathematical interpretations. With this synchronization, modern science was born. And again, what happens as a consequence of this emerging scientific temperament is that, the belief or faith based worldviews were replaced by the reason based scientific outlook. Everything, for everything that happens in this world, for everything that we see around us in this world has a purpose, has a reason, not a purpose, has a reason behind it. Why is it that apples fall down? The famous Newtonian question. Why is it that apples are not hanging on air? They fall down, because there is a reason behind it. From this question, the assumption is that there should be a reason for that. And from this question, Newton arrives at the conclusion, the great gravitation principle was born or rather discovered as a result of this. Now, Copernicus and Galileo brought together the two important elements of scientific method, I have already mentioned it. The empirical, which is based on observation and experiment and the rational, which employs mathematical detective reasoning. Now, we have seen the context, the kind of context in which uh, modern philosophy uh, took its emergence. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, philosophy during this uh, period of renaissance, we can see that it is not a very rich period. Philosophically, it is not a very rich period, it has not produced first rate thinkers. Even Descartes is a, the, who is hailed as the father of modern philosophy, comes after renaissance. But, at the same time we have to acknowledge that 
modern philosophy which began with Descartes would not have been possible without renaissance. So, renaissance is the essential the necessary prerequisite background for the emergence of modern philosophy. The basic philosophical activities that the renaissance period witnessed were uh, thinkers from various traditions revisiting the study of Plato and of course, of Aristotle as well, but Plato was also read uh, very carefully. Because you know we have already seen that uh, with uh, Saint Thomas interpretation of uh, 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 Catholic principles in the light of Aristotelian philosophy, uh, Aristotle became the most prominent thinker in the European uh, intellectual milieu. This was so changing uh, from the times of uh, renaissance, there is a kind of uh, revival uh, of the interest in, in the study of uh, uh, many other philosophers other than Aristotle particularly Plato. And now this is what Bertrand Russell says, it encouraged the habit of regarding intellectual activity as a delightful social adventure, not a clustered mediation aiming at the preservation of a predetermined orthodoxy. So, there is a purpose, the purpose is the habit of regarding intellectual activity as a delightful social adventure, not just where you just admit whatever is there given handed down to you by the tradition. And again St. Thomas's we have already seen this interpretations of Aristotle's were skeptically viewed and the authority of both the Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire began to decline and a new look at philosophical issues, ancient philosophy text and approaches took place. So, when we talk about the major philosophical activities during the renaissance age, it consisted of this revisiting of the ancient text from a new light. And uh, this is from, uh, from Socrates to Sartre, the philosophical quest by Levin, uh, I quote, with the coming of the renaissance, there occurs an expression of a humanistic faith in man, in his powers to direct his life and the life of his society toward freedom and justice. Together with the sense that this power which had been a possession of the individual in the ancient Greek world had been lost in the world of medieval Christendom unquote. So, to summarize renaissance actually asserts it is an ex expression of a humanistic faith in man in his power to decide to direct his life and the life of society around him. It is not that something which is already pre given to him, these ideas are not, are not pre given to him, he has to sort of find it out, clarify it to himself and others, learn from others and lot of other things. Now, when we look at the cultural impact of uh, renaissance. Uh, we could see that this is more visible in, uh, in the field of uh, art and literature, because art and literature had seen a tremendous uh, development during this period of renaissance, during that few centuries, two or three centuries. We can see that uh, independence of art and literature from religious dogmas and mythology, this is the most significant aspect of uh, uh, renaissance art. If you, if you examine renaissance art, painting, sculptures and other things, this is quite visible that independence of art from uh, the dogmas and mythology of religion, portrayal of human glory and not just suffering and death. We could see that during the middle ages, art was dominated by the glorification of suffering and death, which is part of the Christian mythology, where the suffering of Jesus. So, this suffering was highlighted by most of the middle ages art forms, death was glorified during this period because there was a visible uh, skepticism about the life in this world. Life in this world is uh, conceived or it is considered as a result of a sin, the original sin, I mean it is an impact of the original sin which human beings have committed in, in the heaven. But instead during the renaissance period, there is a portrayal of uh, human glory and uh, art and literature turn away from Christian themes to nature as it is seen and perceived. I have already mentioned this uh, a few minutes back that 
the way in which man finds himself in nature, understands nature, relate himself with nature, which includes both animate as well as inanimate world and other human beings. Everything changes with renaissance. Art and literature now turn away from Christian themes to nature. So, nature is reflected in the renaissance art in a very different way and in that reflection we could see humanism, we could see a kind of very positive outlook towards life and even after lives are contemplated in a, in a different fashion by the renaissance thinkers. Overcoming of body negativism, which is uh, also the result of uh, the scientific temperament, because uh, as we have already mentioned, body was treated as uh, something which is the result of uh, uh, the original sin. So, some body is negatively viewed by the Christian world, by the Catholic world and this is what we normally understand as body negativism, body is something which needs to be kept away and uh, this was interpreted uh, from the light of uh, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy by the uh, 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 middle ages uh, philosophers, by the scholastic thinkers. But with the emerging new temperament, this body negativism was uh, overcome. We could see that art and literature, particularly paintings and sculptures were, were uh, increasingly highlighting the beauty of the human body. The human body is once again became a theme. It was a, an eternal theme for the Greek or Roman civilization, which was uh, not very dominant during the Christian period, during the middle ages. Now, it comes back, it is revived, the beauty, the glory of the human body is highlighted. And uh, if you examine the domain of science, again you can see that there are several new insights about the functioning of the human body people like Leonardo da Vinci and all these people have studied the human body thoroughly and there is a view that body is just like any other machine, it is a machine just like any other machine. It has got certain, certain mechanical movements, certain, certain the rules of mechanics, uh, uh, rule, uh, the, the control, the movements of the body as well. And nature became interesting in itself, not just as an expression of the supernatural, I have already mentioned this nature is interesting in itself, it is beautiful and we human beings are fascinated by its beauty and we have every right to enjoy it, to appreciate it and enjoy it and express it our experience. So, renaissance artists were all occupied with this appreciation of the natural beauty and expressing this experience through their works of art. The return of uh, the Greek joy in living. So, this is another aspect of renaissance philosophy, which was uh, absent during the middle ages, where life is always considered as something which is gloomy, something which is negating uh, the eternal joy. Uh, so, the life in this world is always considered as an antithesis to the eternal life, which is there in the heaven. But here the return of the Greek joy, the Greek joy what here means is that the happiness and joy human beings are capable of experiencing by being in this world from the objects of this world. So, your sensual pleasures are once again viewed or approached positively, which was not the case during the Catholic period. And when we talk about the new inventions and discoveries, which naturally follow from this attitude, this attitude of overcoming body negativism, this attitude of accepting validity as well as the possibility of experiencing happiness and joy over objects in this world, things in this world. So, this has led to several very significant inventions and discoveries. See for example, invention of the printing press, invention of gunpowder, then improvement of the compass for navigation, then uh, the discovery of the new world by Columbus and his successors. This is very significant because this has opened up possibilities of trading, settling down in new places and of course, the promise of a new world everything was uh, as a result of this, which is also the result of new scientific advancements. The discovery of the new water route to India and the far east around the Cape of Good Hope. So, it has encouraged trading and uh, commercial activities and contributed to the material and uh, development of uh, uh, European men. Uh, rise and growth of the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther, I have already mentioned this, 
this is on the religious front where uh, the Catholic dogmas were challenged by people like Martin Luther who highlighted the need for approaching and understanding the biblical text from the perspective of, in, of certain new insights. Because you know this is very important because this marks the emergence of hermeneutics, modern hermeneutics because <coughs> Catholic church uh, has uh, already given certain quote unquote official interpretations of the biblical statements. Every biblical expression was officially interpreted by the Catholic church or the churchmen, schoolmen. Some of these interpretations were challenged by others, but the church was not ready to accept them. Gradually this is grown and uh, there was a call for reformation in the whole conception of religion and Martin Luther was uh, the prominent one to initiate it, which has ultimately then resulted in the birth of the protestant church. So, the protestant uh, uh, opposition to catholic dogmas or catholic interpretations have uh, they have resulted in the emergence of hermeneutics. We can see in the works of Schleimacher and William Deltai, particularly Schleimacher who was concerned about the question of interpretation, interpretation of original text initially of the bible later on everything that is expressed. Now, to come back to the question of uh, uh, the philosophy in renaissance, renewed study of Aristotle which you have already mentioned, free from the scholastic interpretations of Aristotle's work secular and scientific approaches and uh, emergence of humanism with uh, emphasis on moral philosophy that address the question of virtue and uh, distancing from epistemological and metaphysical issues. Platonism was reintroduced with renewed interest in Platonic themes and again the revival of Stoicism, Epicureanism, Skepticism all these were part of the renaissance philosophical temperament. Again to summarize this uh, we could see the rise of science, rise of humanism, skepticism and uh, now we find that there is a kind of uh, reassertion of modern philosophy as epistemology where philosophy would examine the sources, the kinds and limits of human knowledge and ethics, the question of criteria and the possibility of moral life without religious principles. How do you know what is good without really employing, without really relying on religious principles and metaphysics questions of reality, universe and God. These questions were also re-articulated. Uh, and uh, explored, examined from the perspective of the new insights gained as a result of renaissance. And when we talk about the modern period, awakening of the reflective spirit has to be re-emphasized and there is of course, a kind of critical approach which was present in the Greek era, which is reintroduced after more than a thousand years and against all authority and tradition. It was emphasizing this aspect that every authority has to be challenged, has to be questioned and tradition needs to be viewed with skepticism and against absolutism and collectivism. So, we need to employ the human intellect, the human intellect needs to be allowed to, to explore nature by following its own, its own rules and uh, laws. Then assertion of freedom in thought, feeling and action, state took the place of church states more towards constitutionalism and democratic institutions. So, the emergence of individualism. So, you could see that there is an overall change in all aspects of life during this period. Then again when it comes to philosophy uh, in particular, reason becomes the only authority in philosophy and science, truth needs to be achieved through free and impartial enquiry. It is not something which is a result of revelation as the Christian theologians could thought it was, but it has to be achieved through free and impartial enquiry and theology lost its importance. The practical applicability of knowledge is emphasized during this period. That is the reason why science has become very important and uh, with this background we will uh, see the most important features of modern philosophy. Some of the features of modern philosophy are number one independent search for truth. What I mean by independent is as I already mentioned free from the dogmas, free from the religious and 
other dogmas that was uh, inherited by the Catholic Church. In, in this aspect, it resembles the ancient Greek thought. It is rationalistic, human reason is the highest authority, nothing else but reason is the only arbiter. It is naturalistic because it attempts to explain inner and outer nature without supernatural presuppositions. So, uh, later on we would see that in modern philosophy, some of the themes of modern philosophy are mind and body dualism. Mind constitutes an independent domain of reality, which is inner nature, world, body is the domain of the external world, which includes our body, material bodies. So, these are all very important philosophical themes of the modern age, which the modern philosophers try to approach from a very critical and rational perspective. And then finally, last but not the least scientific, keeping in touch with the new sciences, the new sciences that were emerging. We could see that almost all the modern philosophers right from Descartes onwards were very closely following the developments uh, that were taking place during the modern period. This is basically given by, these features were basically given by Frank Tilly in his book A History of, West, uh, A History of Philosophy. And uh, again the emergence of uh, rationalism and empiricism as uh, independent and opposing schools of philosophy is a very important feature of modern philosophy. We are going to see this in detail. These are the two very important schools of modern philosophy, rationalism and empiricism. The impact of modern scientific understanding on philosophy, philosophy regains the status of a foundational discipline as epistemology. This is another aspect which needs to be understood in modern age, because in ancient philosophy was uh, truly a foundational discipline, because ancient philosophers conceived philosophy as the discipline which would examine the foundations of all human reality. So, philosophers were reality seekers, they, they were trying to understand truth, they were trying to understand reality, what is that reality out of which everything is constituted, that was the primordial philosophical question. So, philosophy was a true foundational discipline, but later on you could see that philosophy has been uh, uh, reduced to the level of uh, uh, merely a support to uh, theology or religious uh, faith and belief and all that by the middle ages. And even during the renaissance, uh, philosophy never had a very major role to play, because it was basically considered as, I mean with the emergence of science, philosophy literally lost its glory. Philosophy was the foundational discipline by means of which we human beings know and understand nature. But now with the emergence of modern science, with its peculiar and unique methodology, modern science is better equipped to understand reality, to the understand the world, to know the world, to have knowledge about the world. So, what will happen to philosophy? Philosophy lost all its glory. Now, philosophers during the modern period were trying to reassert the importance of philosophy in human life as a foundational endeavor. What is it? It is epistemology. All sciences, of course, sciences are concerned with knowledge, they deal with knowledge knowledge about one or other particular department of the universe, but philosophy is a discipline which deals with knowledge as such. It raises the question what is knowledge, how can you say that something is knowledge, what is the criteria by applying which we distinguish between knowledge and opinion. So, what is knowledge, what are the kinds of knowledge, what are the sources of knowledge, what are the limitations of knowledge. These are some of the very important philosophical concerns during the modern period. So, philosophy as epistemology regains its foundational status during the modern period. And uh, philosophy's objectives are re-articulated as epistemological objectives, no longer deals with the question of ultimate reality, philosophy deals with knowledge, I mentioned it the nature, kinds and limitations and sources of knowledge. So, we can see that before we summarize the kind of philosophical approaches, philosophical systems which we are going to deal under the heading of modern philosophy. So, we can see that it starts with Descartes, who is considered as a father of modern philosophy, who is uh, followed by another philosopher Spinoza and Leibniz. So, these are uh, people who are called as uh, uh, 
uh, rationalist, they are the rationalist. And then on the other hand we could see that there was a different philosophical approach that was developing in the British world. This is basically in the uh, non English speaking uh, European uh, uh, countries like France and Germany, Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz, Descartes was, was a French and, uh, but these philosophers mostly were British. So, we normally call it as uh, British empiricism, uh, the most prominent uh, ones are uh, John Locke, Berkeley and uh, David Hume. So, these are the two uh, opposing traditions of uh, modern philosophy, rationalism and empiricism and we could see that these two opposing traditions were uh, brought together into one single framework to explain the new modern temperament that is emerging by Immanuel Kant in his critical philosophy. So, Kant really functions as a junction which brings together these two system and from there we can see two independent development or several independent developments, but basically and fundamentally two streams are quite visible. One in the direction uh, which goes upwards like people like Hegel, Fitch, Schilling and then Marx, Karl Marx, then uh, Schopenhauer, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, all these people who develop what today we understand as the continental philosophical tradition, which ultimately culminated in the development of phenomenology by, by the German philosopher Edmund Husserl, hermeneutics by uh, Gadamer and uh, Heidegger, then existentialism by Jean Paul Sartre and many others. And on the other hand, the empiricist tradition develops uh, in this direction through Bentham, Comte and J. S. Mill which culminates in the 20th century movements like positivism, logical empiricism and analytic philosophy. To summarize, this is what we normally understand as uh, modern philosophy and uh, its uh, uh, offshoots and uh, the two traditions which we are going to address are empiricism and rationalism, the two important schools of modern philosophy and the division is based on uh, the sources of knowledge what is the question is what is the source of knowledge and uh, one group of philosophers like rationalist would say that the source of knowledge is already innate and uh, the empiricist would argue that the source of knowledge is uh, uh, experience. So, this is uh, we will now wind up our uh, discussion on uh, the introduction to modern philosophy right here and uh, carry out our further lectures by concentrating more on these traditions and uh, contribution the philosophy the individual philosophers who have contributed to the development of these uh, uh, respective philosophical schools uh, in the subsequent lectures. Now, uh, thank you.